Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, uh, to Paula for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, and so this is the title of my topic uh, that was given to me by Paula. <laughs> How to use Concourse CI to deliver Bosch releases. And so that's what I'll be talking about nominally. I say nominally because uh, this is Bosch Day. This may be the one conference where people actually want to see tons of YAML. <laughs> <coughs> uh, YAML you're going to be disappointed. So I will uh, try to substantially talk about Bosch and Concourse, uh, but I took some liberties to go a little bit meta to start with and then um, talk about why we arrived at some of the conclusions we've done on some of our teams around how we deliver Bosch releases and <clears throat> how we use Concourse. A little bit about me, uh, I'm a product manager at Pivotal. Uh, some of the products I manage, CF release, etcd release, console release, and Bosch bootloader. Previously, I was an engineer uh, working on Diego, ops manager, and Bosch. So what are we gonna talk about? Why software in the first place? Going real meta on you. Complexity versus simplicity. Testable, discoverable contracts. Uh, complexity in the Bosch ecosystem, and then some of the recommended practices around Bosch and Concourse that, <clears throat> that we've arrived at. All right, so uh, what are some reasons, I won't uh, claim to be comprehensive here, but what are some reasons why we do things with machines in the first place? Uh, one obvious reason, automate physical labor. Uh, Using machines, we can do things faster, more consistently, at higher scales, and more reproducibly. Um, the things we just can't do physically, or if you get a human to do them enough times, there's going to be a lot of defects. People throw out their backs. Uh, you know, you can only build skyscrapers so high before you start to need some sort of machine. Um, we can also use especially software to automate cognitive labor. Uh, I like this term that Martin Ford used in his CF keynote, cognitive labor. Uh, I think it describes a lot of what we're trying to solve for when we build, when we build software. Uh, you guys can probably recognize this as an XKCD comic. Um, and we, we try to solve for the, the same sorts of problems, speed, consistency, scale, and reproducibility. Um, the, the crux is complex cognitive tasks are hard to do well. Let me dive into what some of those, what I mean by some of those terms. Complex, uh, meaning many pieces, unclear interactions, and requiring implicit knowledge. Cognitive tasks, such as doing taxes, deploying software, right? CF push. Uh, when, when my mom and dad ask me what I do, I say I build software for people who build software. <clears throat> because we have the same problems as the people whom we're building software for, right? Provisioning servers is hard, and getting it right, doing it the same way every time is hard. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the story of Knight Capital. If you don't know it, just Google it. It's a great story in human error and things that could have been automated when provisioning servers makes you lose $400 million in half an hour. Um, right? But if you think about provisioning a, a web server for your app and scaling it up, it's all these many pieces, unclear interactions, requiring implicit knowledge. How do you teach the next person on your team to do this? Uh, all kind of are the, the reasons why we, why we love CF Push and Bosch Deploy. Uh, and they're hard to do well, right? Just like what I had previously, doing it fast, consistently, at scale, and reproducibly. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, there, are, there are many more reasons than this about why we build software. There are um, complexity, solving for complexity is just one of them. And there are many different sources of complexity and many ways to deal with them. Uh, but one approach or one sort of uh, 
sort of rule of thumb to keep in mind when building anything is uh, having testable, discoverable contracts. So instead of uh, uh, having, you know, when you have to do your taxes, there's just all these forms and, you know, nobody knows, nobody knows how to do taxes, let's be, let's be real. Uh, what's nice about something like TurboTax is it provides you a very clear interaction. You log in and you just enter the things and you hit next. So it provides interactions uh, that let you do what you're trying to do and nothing else. It asks the consumer for input required for those interactions and nothing more, right? It's very clear, like, just fill out this line and this line. All those other blank spots in these forms, don't have to fill them out. Are you missing something? It'll tell you exactly what you're missing and where you can get that thing. And provide the output that that the solution is supposed to provide and nothing else. Don't confuse people with other, other noise. And I say people, but I, I use the term consumers here because uh, some, I'll get to it in a second. Um, so everything you see up here, these, these first three bullets, this is a contract. This is the interaction I'm gonna provide. These are the inputs you need to give me and this is the output and the side effects I'm gonna create for you. So this is a way, that, you know, what's key is the and no more, right? Make it clean and simple. Um, but one risk about doing this kind of thing is maybe you've just shoved the complexity somewhere else, right? Maybe you've simplified one thing by, by making just something else more complex. Uh, the example I have here is um, we all know and love concourse. And Concourse is a side project, originally was an Alex Sirachi side project. But we're probably all familiar with some other Alex Sirachi <laughs> side projects, which, uh, <laughs> which solved some problems and made some things simpler. But I think a lot of people have, have had to fight with the additional complexity it's created in just another place. Um, so making these contracts testable and discoverable and making it clear to people to understand how you're supposed to use something and how it might work um, is key to not just shoving the complexity somewhere else and creating a, a just a different problem. Um, and so I, on the previous slide I used the term consumers uh, to try to keep it general because this problem crops up not just in a user-facing product, um, products and services, but also between you know, the services that we care about are services that are deployed as distributed systems, right? This is Bosch Day. But between the system components themselves, you want to keep those contracts clean and simple. And going down a level, between the processes running on a particular component in your system, and even further down, down to your modules, objects, and functions, right? So just down to, you, down to the level of your code. <clears throat> and this has... Uh, this has quite direct parallels to the stuff we build in the Bosch ecosystem. So going back a slide, user-facing products and services, that's your Bosch deployment. Uh, the distributed system components, those are your Bosch instance groups. Uh, Bosch releases and jobs, those are your processes. And the business logic source code, right, your release slash source, uh, that's your source code. And <clears throat> Uh, so these, these uh, design concerns happen at every layer, right? Whether you're a product manager worrying about the end user or whether you're a developer worrying about your, you know, your Bosch releases or your source code, these contracts, interfaces, simplicity, these, are, these things crop up at, at every level. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is I, I made it a point to separate Bosch deployments and Bosch releases as separate concerns. And that's gonna be a, a theme I come back to a little later. <clears throat> so in addition to these four things here, also the, the test pipelines themselves can potentially suffer from complexity, right? If you're trying to deliver something, you're delivering it using Concourse with your own test pipelines, and those things themselves can get quite complex. Um, if you have to ramp up a new team member and they can't make heads or tails of how anything else gets built in your system, 
that, that can be a big problem. And Concourse goes a long way to solving that, excuse me, right? With, uh, <clears throat> with older systems, Gen Jenkins and GoCD, where really the, the, the MO for interacting with them was clicking around in a GUI. Uh, after you've clicked around, that information is lost. And you can try to you know, export the XML and check it in somewhere, but it's not, that's kind of an afterthought. Whereas with Concourse, there's only one way to do it, and it's declaratively in your pipeline config. Still, those things can get complex, and there can still be hidden assumptions and unknown moving parts and um, unseen dependencies and that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about some of the uh, recommended practices that we've come up on for dealing with these sorts of things. Um, so one is no snowflake environments. Uh, if you have, so something that's typical to do when you have a Bosch deployment that you're, that you're distributing is you, in your CI, you actually deploy it somewhere, right? So you might spin up an AWS environment, you might spin up a Bosch Lite environment, what have you, uh, and you might have hacked it together by hand clicking around in the AWS console, uh, or you ran some script once, and now you never run that script again because nobody knows what happens when if you run it again. Um, and that's, uh, I'm kind of speaking about how we've done things on Cloud Foundry historically, right? Our, our initial um, environments for integrating Cloud Foundry, one of the main environments is called A1. That thing was set up years ago before cloud formation was really a thing, and it was all done by clicking around. Now nobody wants to touch that thing. Nobody knows how it got there. Nobody knows what's in it. Nobody knows whether you can remove stuff from it, so it's a snowflake, and uh, um, it leads to lots of fear in the development process. Uh, so one of the recommended practices is to not snowflake any environment that you use in your CI. Rather, what I'd recommend is to automate the provisioning of your environments in your CI and actually have CI run that build continuously, prove that you can idempotently recreate your environment at any time. Right? Anytime anything goes wrong, you know, worst case scenario, blow it away and, and recreate it from scratch, click a button and bring it back. Um, and separate your per environment config resources. So let me show you one of our pipelines. So this is our <coughs> mega CI. Uh, I won't get into the history of the name mega CI, but uh, the infrastructure team that works on console and etcd release, um, the environment that that team's concourse itself is deployed to, is deployed by this job, and I'm not gonna click it right now, but in theory, I could click it and it should just know up, right? It should just see that none of the AWS re resources have changed, so it won't touch anything there. Nothing has changed in the Bosch configuration that we're using to deploy that concourse, so it should just end after a few seconds of no hopping. Um, so being able to reproducibly, reproducibly create your environments, uh, having no snowflakes was, was one of the points I mentioned. And the other one was separating out your environment config. So we've come upon a pattern that we like quite a bit, which is to have separate repos for every environment. So if you're, by environment, I sort of mean, you know, if you think about AWS, it's a VPC with whatever subnets and load balancers and, and stuff that you need, right? So if you, for example, if you're testing a release or deployment and you want to test it on AWS and vSphere and OpenStack, then you might have an OpenStack environment and a vSphere environment and an AWS environment. Uh, and your concourse itself may live in, an, in a separate environment because you, you want to have a different life cycle for the things you're actually testing and deploying from your concourse itself. So what we've done is we've separated out, you know, any private credentials, SSH keys, um, just configuration parameters that are specific to an environment. 
we've extracted that into its own resource uh, so that if we need to, if a credential gets leaked, if we ever need to rotate, repave, and uh, repair this environment, it's totally encapsulated in one thing and it, it's not going to leak into anything else. We can, we as a team can comfortably blow this away without affecting any other teams. Right? So this is also, uh, this came out of the history that we had on Cloud Foundry of having <coughs> all our credentials and all our environments in one big repo. Um, and a lot of these things have come from the fact that Cloud Foundry has just grown a lot over, over the last you know, you know, three, four years. Um, a lot of these problems, you know, complexity, is, it's a human problem. So a lot of things that we've had to solve is how do we scale this thing up to now a foundation with so many teams and so many contributing organizations and members all wanting to iterate independently. Uh, it used to be easy to just have lots of stuff in one repo, but that doesn't scale anymore. So separating these things out <coughs> is the, the pattern that we've come, come upon here. So a couple of the other uh, recommended practices. Test your task scripts. So what we do in our concourse pipelines is, um, by the way, it's probably a bit late to say this, but I'm going to assume everybody knows what a Bosch job is and a concourse task is, et cetera. If not, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so you're going to have your concourse pipelines. Your pipeline has many jobs. Your jobs will have many puts and gets and also some tasks. And your tasks are, uh, you have a task YAML, which sort of uh, tells Concourse the basic setup of your task, you know, what, uh, what Docker image it should it, uh, run on top of, what parameters does it need as input, uh, what resources does it need as input, or rather what, what things on the file system. And then you have an actual task script itself, which if it's simple, it should be bash, but if it's complicated, don't write it in bash. Uh, whatever you do though, if you, if you make it at all, if it's at all complex, test it. People usually don't think to test their test scripts, but you should. Uh, if anything is sufficiently complex, you should think of your test scripts as, as a tool that you're using. And if you're building a tool, you should test your tool because... Uh, an example? An example? Uh, I don't know if I have an example uh, offhand. So, okay, so, okay, now we're really into concourse discussion. Right. So, uh, I will show you, I'll show you the pipeline, actually. It has, uh, let me, I'll get to it in a second. So, test your task scripts and build your own task images. So one thing that we, another sort of one shared thing that we had for all the teams that sort of broke down once we started to scale out the teams quite a bit was we had this one massive bloated Docker image called Runtime CI, which had multiple versions of Ruby in it. It had a Bash RC in it. It had God knows what else in it. Uh, you don't need two versions of Ruby to like get clone and do some JQ or something like that, right? Um, when, you, when you have no idea what your tasks actually depend on, uh, that, can, that can put you in a scary place, right? So build your own task images. Uh, don't, don't rely on external dependencies for them. It's not that hard to build a task uh, images for your, your Bosch tasks. Keep them clean and simple. Um, and build them in concourse, build them in CI. So let me show you this one. So this is, uh, this is our pipeline for our CI itself. So the, the things that CI itself needs, the tasks and the Docker images, this is the pipeline that actually um, builds those images and also tests its own tasks. So we have this, Mega CI unit 
tests uh, job. And this will test, I guess we have tests for like different sorts of manifest generation things. I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, but any sort of code that we have that's sufficiently complex in our concourse tests themselves, we've written Ginkgo tests for them. Uh, you can look at the repo to, to get more details. Uh, and then we have our Docker images. And we, we wrestled for a while on what's the right level of um, granularity for our Docker images. Uh, should you have a different Docker image for every single job? Should you have one monolithic Docker image or something in between? And we landed on something that I think worked out really nicely, which is something in between. We have a really lightweight, minimal Docker image, which just has bare bones, um, like curl and wget, and a git, and stuff like that. And then we have a Golang Docker image, which builds on top of that, because we do a lot of Go, so being able to build and test Go things. Then we have a deployment Docker image, so this will, it's only here that we actually have some Ruby, so we have Ruby, the Bosch CLI, Bosch init, those sorts of things. And then because we test some stuff in Bosch Lite, we have a Vagrant Docker image. Uh, otherwise, there's no, re no reason to have Vagrant in all your Docker images. Okay, um, moving on with this. Uh, manage Bosch jobs with real programs. So what I mean by that is um, your Bosch jobs... Right, yeah. The va so the VM itself? The VM itself, are you talking about when building the Docker image? No, later on. When we use that. No, no, no. So we just use Vagrant with the AWS provider to bring up a Bosch light elsewhere. Um, I was actually going to mention something here. I've never used it myself, so I didn't want to write it as a recommended practice, but I know Dimitri's been working on a essentially a Bosch light Docker image. And so this would be, rather than you having an image with Vagrant in it where you use to spin up uh, an AWS VM somewhere else using Vagrant so that you get Bosch light running in it and you can deploy to that, you get a Docker image that itself is running Bosch light and has the Bosch CLI in there. So we could, we might actually start to switch to that if we want to, if we want to replicate our, like, we can deploy this thing to Bosch Lite builds, we can just do that inside the Docker image. That will be pretty sweet. I don't know if it's, he, he can't hear. <laughs> I can see him, but uh, we can ask him at some point whether it's legit or not. So he's on the panel, basically, right? Yeah. yeah. You got a question for him, you can ask him. Bosch Lite as a Bosch deployment? So we talk to a Bosch, uh -huh. say, hey, can you please deploy Bosch Lite? Okay. Instead of using Vagrant? Do you have a Bosch Lite Bosch release? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Uh, many options in the Bosch ecosystem. Oh, I like the one, the Docker container. Just yeah, yeah. Um, so, manage Bosch jobs with real programs. Uh, this is the story of confab and console release that we learned the hard way. So most people have Bosch jobs. Just realized I wasn't anywhere near the mic the whole time. Uh, most people have Bosch jobs. Is that is that better? Was I like inaudible the whole time? All right. Okay. I don't want to hear myself, actually. So most people have Bosch jobs, and in your Bosch jobs, you have uh, your spec that defines all the properties you're going to use, and then you tend to have two types of things in your templates. You tend to have um, executables, right? CTL scripts, ctl.sh.erb. If it ends with .sh.erb, it's not a real program. Uh, and then you probably have some yaml.erb. And if what you're building is sufficiently simple, you might be able to get away with um, 
using that ERB to do a little bit of logic and dump that into your YAML or, or dump that into your bash and then maybe your bash is simple enough that it's that it's simple and it's not likely to, to cause you problems. But if you're trying to, especially if you're trying to manage a stateful service like Postgres where you're worried about migrating data or if you're trying to manage something like console where you can't just bring up a bunch of console nodes and expect them to sync up and work correctly together. They have to be orchestrated uh, quite gingerly, right? Um, trying to get all the logic right so that you can scale up, scale down, you know, rotate credentials, shoot a node in the head and bring it back up. Uh, trying to get I've been waiting for the announcement. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, trying to get that right in bash, uh, in bash.erb is, is a nightmare. Uh, so do yourself a favor and don't do that. Uh, there's no reason to do that. You can write programs in real languages like Go, which you can test and compile them and use that program to um, orchestrate the start, you know, whatever logic you need around actually starting up your underlying business logic process, right? So this is, this is a, like, everybody has business logic. You have console as a binary, or if you're writing cloud controller, you have the cloud controller app itself. And then you have this, this uh, mysterious contract with Bosch, right, where there's a monet file, and you get some stuff thrown into your ERB context and you have some helpers. Uh, and rather than putting the logic in there where you're never gonna test it because you can't test it, just dump all the data into, dump the data that it gives you into a raw file and delegate to some program that you can unit test to actually uh, you know, take all that stuff, <clears throat> unmarshal all that data, and, and do all the ifs and else's that you need to do in a tested way. So manage them with real programs, and like I just said, unit test and system test that logic. So it, when you build that program, the, the one we have for console, we call it confab, unit test it, and then system test it. So if you claim that um, you can scale up and scale down and continue to provide a service, uh, you should have system tests for that. All right, am I running short on time? Yeah, all right. Uh, keep releases small enough to be used with hand-editable example manifests and validate those manifests in CI. If your release is so big that it's hard to do that, think of that release as a deployment and think about r delivering that deployment separately from delivering the s releases, the smaller releases that should be composing that deployment. Uh, in the interest of time, there's a pipeline, you can click on it in the slides and ask me more, more details later. I'm gonna move on to some of the other practices. Cut your final releases in CI. Um, if you want to do acceptance on this before you cut the release or you need to uh, get input from several other members in the foundation before you cut a release, you probably wanna do this process manually. Uh, if it's something that is small and can move fast, like console release or etsy d release, just cut the final release at the end of your pipeline. No snowflake buckets. So creating a final release means uploading final release assets to a bucket. That bucket shouldn't show up as a snowflake. You have CI idempotently create that bucket with the right IAM users. Um, separate pipeline configs from params. Um, this is a really nice pattern that we've, we've come upon <clears throat> of having all our pipeline, um, all our pipeline YAML in public repositories with, you know, mustache templating that, that uh, Fly supports and all the private credentials in a, in a separate location, right? You could either put them in, in Vault or LastPass or just in a private repo. Um, this helps makes 
how your pipelines work, totally discoverable, even to the public, which is really nice. Strive to make all your jobs public. This is, this is something we really try to strive for on the CF release um, pipelines. Uh, and so you can see we actually, we actually test that all our jobs are publicly viewable. Uh, separate the process of creating the release from deploying it and testing it. Uh, if you're going to be deploying your releases to multiple different environments to test that it works on different IASs or in different configurations, build it early so you're not wasting time building the release over and over again. Separate your deploy and test so that if the test fails, you can just rerun the test if necessary, rather than having to rerun the whole, the whole thing and leverage a lot of the Bosch-specific concourse resources that are available to you. Bosch IO stem cells releases and deployments. Uh, here are some resources. So you can see our release repos. You can look at our pipelines and look at the pipeline configs and how we've laid them out. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, email is probably the best way. Uh, there's a Twitter handle. I'm pretty active on the mailing list, so you can ask questions there if you think they're more general audience you know, appropriate. I have a website and a few GitHubs. That's my work GitHub. There's Slack, too. Awesome, thank you very much. I think we have time for one question while I work out where the next speaker is. Oh, he's dashing to the front. Uh, any one single question? Anyone? The compact. Yeah. Can you put that inside the console release or is it a separate? Package? It's in the console release. It's a separate package. Uh, the source is there. Is it useful to anyone else in the console universe or is it specifically? It's specifically to glue the contract between Bosch and running the actual console process. So it's not useful to anyone who's not in the Bosch console universe. Right. It's, it's like an agent, so it's like an agent. So Monet runs this little agent. Mm. The agent's responsible. It actually, it, it, it figures out all the, it renders all the config templates that console needs. It determines, you know, when to actually start console and with what parameters. And then it actually just exits and leaves the console process running. Oh, so it leaves it to monitor, to run it. it writes the PID file when it, you know, when console is ready, and then it itself exits, and you get the PID file of the console process. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.